and something that we can identify specific reasons uh, for warming or changes in Earth's climate. So current climate change. We've identified that the major influence that humans have on Earth's climate and atmosphere has to do with the carbon cycle. And the carbon cycle is one of those things that you maybe learn about in like fifth grade, I think, at least in the United States. And you probably don't hear much about it again. Uh, it's not really a cycle. It's more a, a system of carbon storage on Earth. So, kind of give you information ahead. Uh, carbon is in all life on Earth. It's in everything that was alive, and it's in everything that will be alive. Um, but it's also in the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. And so carbon moves through different storage facilities, different re reservoirs, depending on uh, what's happening on Earth. If you have lots of plants and animals on Earth, then there's more carbon in those living things. If there's fewer plants on Earth, then there's more carbon other places. And sometimes there's more carbon in the atmosphere. So the number one biggest carbon reservoir, the thing that holds the most carbon, Number one is marine sediments. So this is uh, rocks at the bottom of the ocean, marine sediments. Marine ocean sediments, uh, broken up bits of rock at the bottom of the ocean. So what this is, and, and the reason why they get there, is you have uh, most living things on Earth have been in the ocean in Earth's history, the history of life on Earth. Uh, so things are floating around, swimming in the ocean. They eventually die. And they eventually sink to the bottom of the ocean. When they do that, they decompose slowly, but there's carbon left behind. And then other sea creatures swimming around die and land on top of those other dead sea creatures. They decompose too. And so now you've got like thousands of feet of dead stuff piled on top of other dead stuff. And that's marine sediments. Uh, you can see these on land all over the world. You can see them under, well, it's harder to see them underwater. But like along our coast, along the coast of California, out here, there's a, a set of marine sediments called the Monterey Formation. Monterey Formation is a diatomaceous siltstone, which you don't care about that. But it's made up of a whole bunch of dead sea creatures called diatomes. They have a calcium exoskeleton, uh, and they make this kind of like bright white rock. That's the Monterey Formation, made up of dead sea creatures, which is a marine sediment. Cool. All right. Next biggest carbon reservoir is ocean water. So actual ocean water, salt water, has lots of dissolved carbon in it. You knew ocean water had salt. You know it had water. It's got a bunch of other minerals in it, too. Carbon is, is one of those. Questions? OK. Uh, third biggest carbon reservoir is fossil fuels. What are fossil fuels? Like, what are the fossil fuels? Uh, yeah, natural gas. What else? Stuff in your car? Yeah, we call it oil. Uh huh. And coal. Those are the fossil fuels. So, those sea creatures that are floating around animals and plants, plankton, algae, kelp, all that stuff that's in the ocean it dies, it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. And if it decomposes without oxygen, anaerobic decomposition then it turns into oil. 
Part of that decomposition process, uh, natural gas is created. So imagine that, that you know, there's dead, dead animals at the bottom of the ocean. More dead animals land on them, pile up, and, and they decompose. And then there's like a mudslide off the coast. And so all this dirt comes out from, from the coast, lands on top of these decomposing animals, and kind of traps them with a layer of, of mud of different material. So now those sea creatures decompose without oxygen, so they create oil as a byproduct. That's actually what we have in the Monterey Formation I was talking about. That white rock off of our coast, it's marine sediment, is the source of oil in California. So if you see uh, those oil platforms out in the ocean off of like Long Beach, Huntington Beach, they're getting oil out of our Monterey Formation, that marine sediment. Uh, and that's where oil comes from. Uh, coal is created usually from like tropical rainforests decomposing, uh, and natural gas is released from both of those. But if you go to places uh, where the Monterey Formation is underwater, you can actually see little gas bubbles coming out of the water, and it's natural gases escaping from those decomposing dead sea creatures. Questions? Yeah. So I always thought that we got gas from dinosaur species. Uh, is that no, that that's. Myth? Yeah, you probably learned that in fifth grade, and you're like, oh, that's I'm remembering that one. Dinosaur poop yeah. is great. Uh, no, but I mean, maybe some of it is, yeah, but it's more like actual dead dinosaurs and more so dead sea creatures and plant material can, are, are much higher in biomass than, you know, just dinosaurs. Like dinosaurs is more exciting. It's like I put dinosaurs in my car. That's great. But it's probably just, you know, ancient million year old trees that have decomposed. That's what you're putting in your car or sea creatures. Other questions? Okay, so fossil fuels, third biggest carbon reservoir. After that, carbon is stored in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And after that, the smallest carbon reservoir is live plants and animals. And it, it, you should interpret that to mean like all living things, algaes are not plants, uh, fungi are not plants or animals. We're including that stuff too, bacteria, insects. Like you think people are very numerous, but there are way more ants on earth than people in terms of numbers and like weight. So if you added up the weight of all ants, and people, there's, there's ants way more than humans do. And that's the, the case for many insect varieties. So uh, yeah, people are all over the place. But there's way more ants than us. So live plants and animals, live, living things, are the last carbon reservoir. Questions? Okay, so uh, starting in the 1850s, Industrial Revolution, humans started taking uh, carbon from fossil fuels, coal, and oil mostly, mostly coal first, followed by oil, and now we're really getting into natural gas. We're taking that carbon, and we are instead putting the carbon into the atmosphere. So we're just changing carbon reservoirs. Big deal. Why does that cause problems? Um, it causes problems because of the greenhouse effect. So greenhouse effect is a naturally occurring process. Uh, the basics of it, we're going to draw the atmosphere. There's the atmosphere. Here's Earth's surface. And we've got carbon dioxide floating around in the atmosphere. Uh, and really, we should call those greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases or GHGs. 
Uh, and what are the greenhouse gases? You all know the main one? Huh? Carbon dioxide. Yeah, carbon dioxide, everybody's favorite greenhouse gas. There's two more. Everybody's second favorite greenhouse gas? Methane. Yeah, methane. I don't know if it's your favorite. Uh, and the, the last greenhouse gas is water vapor. So it's H2O. Not in liquid form, but in, in vapor form. So kind of like clouds. All right, so we've got these greenhouse gases floating around, carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor. They're in the atmosphere. You can't see them, but they're these little blue dots in our picture. And so the Earth gets incoming solar radiation in the form of short wave radiation. And you knew that already because we talked about it. So we get incoming short wave radiation. Uh, short wave radiation enters the Earth's atmosphere. Enters atmosphere. That radiation gets absorbed by the Earth. So the Earth absorbs that incoming shortwave radiation. We talked about that a whole bunch in chapter four. You already knew some of it gets reflected, some of it gets scattered, some of it gets absorbed by land or water, and then it conducts to different surfaces, right? Uh, so that enters the atmosphere and is absorbed by Earth. All right. So we absorb that incoming solar radiation. Now, the Earth emits that radiation as thermal energy. Long wave thermal energy is emitted. Earth emits or releases long wave thermal energy. Earth emits long wave thermal energy. We got that energy from the sun, changed it to heat, and then we just let it off. And then that thermal energy is trapped in the atmosphere by greenhouse gases. So GHGs, greenhouse gases, trap thermal energy. Or heat in the atmosphere. Questions? That's the greenhouse effect. That's, that's simplified, but pretty easy to understand. Uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor trap heat in the atmosphere. That's the greenhouse effect. Uh, like I said, people, starting in the 1850s, started taking carbon dioxide out of here and putting it into here. And we actually recently discovered a lot of it gets absorbed by the ocean as well. So the ocean's actually holding a lot of carbon that we uh, convert from fossil fuels too. So is this a good thing or a bad thing? Like, in, in broad terms, do you like the greenhouse effect or not? It's actually a, a good thing for people. Like, I, I love the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is fantastic. The greenhouse effect makes Earth a comfortable place. It's the thing in our atmosphere that actually insulates uh, us against releasing heat and freezing, off com or freezing completely at night. So the greenhouse effect... Uh, keeps Earth's average temperature around uh, 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So, starting in the 1850s, uh, Earth's average temperature was is it 59. I'm sorry.
right? 59? You guys don't know. Yeah, it is 59. Cool. I was right. Uh, 1850s, our average temperature was 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, at that time, how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere? Uh, we were at uh, 288 parts per million. PPM of carbon dioxide. Now, what is 288 parts per million? Uh, that's equivalent to uh, 0 0.0288 percent of the atmosphere. So back when we were talking about the, the uh, composition of gases in our atmosphere, you knew, or you know now, 78% is nitrogen, 21% is oxygen, and 1% is all those trace gases. Of that 1%, 0 0.0288% is carbon dioxide, or 288 parts per million. Has anybody used parts per million before? Did I already tell you about this? Maybe, the, like restaurant stuff? Yeah, okay. So that's like the other people who use parts per million is, is restaurant employees, cleaning tables. Uh, but it's also, it's measured, parts per million is a common measurement method for anything that's in small quantities, like this, where, okay, you've got a million units, 288 of those million units are carbon dioxide, which turns out to be this percent of the atmosphere's carbon dioxide. Okay. So we start in the 1850s taking coal out of the ground, burning it, putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, and so the PPM of carbon dioxide starts to increase at that point. Uh, we eventually started measuring it in 2010. So that's a big jump. 2010, uh, the PPM or percentage of carbon in our atmosphere was... Uh, 390, which is 0.039%. All right, so it's not a percent higher. It's not even a tenth of a percent higher. It's a hundredth of a percent higher. But in the overall amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, we're actually increasing by quite a bit. After 2010s, or you know, starting kind of in the 90s as people were measuring this, uh, we started taking measurements more frequently. In uh, 2013, this was up to uh, 400 parts per million. And in 2013, when we hit 400 parts per million, uh, we officially increased in temperature by uh, one degree Celsius or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. One point eight degree increase in global temperature, or one degree Celsius. Can you guys talk less? Kind of strange. Thanks. Okay, now uh, this number has kept going up. As of twenty seventeen, I don't have numbers for twenty nineteen because it's still twenty nineteen. Uh, this is up between 405 and 410 parts per million. So it's still increasing, still going up. Uh, which means that Earth's temperature, Earth's ability to trap heat, keeps increasing as well. And that's really what's making temperature increase. Like, why is global climate change happening? Because Earth is trapping more heat in its atmosphere. That's real easy. Earth's trapping more heat in its atmosphere. Um, and it turns out when that's happening is not in the, the warmest months. And the warmest months are getting warmer, but the months that are supposed to be cold and the times when Earth is supposed to be cold, like the nighttime, 
is actually warmer than it has been historically. So at night, sun sets, we're not getting heat anymore. Earth's just emitting that thermal energy. Well, the atmosphere traps more heat, so the night times are actually warmer than they used to be. Uh, winter seasons are warmer than they used to be. Summers are, are warm too. But the major effect of that is that like nights and winters are warmer than they were. Yeah. Can you explain ppm again? What it means? Yeah, parts per million. Uh, imagine you have like a bucket that's atmosphere in this case. So we have a big bucket of atmosphere. Cool. And in this bucket, there's one million pieces of atmosphere. So cool, I've got a million atmosphere in my bucket. Uh, of that million pieces, 288 of them are carbon dioxide. So like you could dig through your bucket, uh, and if it's a million M&Ms, 288 of them are going to be carbon dioxide M&Ms. Good. Uh, uh, which is, I guess, like I don't know why exactly people use ppm as a measurement, but people do. I guess it's easier to, to conceptualize parts per million over really small percentages like that. Questions? Okay, so um, around the, like, when did Inconvenient Truth come out? 2004, I think. That was Al Gore's movie where he said, hey, climate change is happening, everybody look. Uh, scientists knew that there were changes occurring, but Al Gore is like, everybody look, this is important, 2004. Uh, 2010, the United States got more serious about stopping the release of carbon dioxide. It's been 10 years, we're still releasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The PPM is still going up. But around 2010 is when everybody decided, hey, if we get down to 1990s levels of carbon dioxide, everything will be okay. 1990s levy levels were uh, 350 parts per million. Um, and so 350 has been the goal for 10 years. We've been saying, let's get back down to 350 parts per million. That'll be okay if we can just get down to 350. 10 years later, we're higher. Okay, so what is the effect of this? What is warming climate, what does warming temperature do? Well, yeah, so the overall effects, climate change effects. Now, the major effect of that, of this increase in carbon dioxide, climate change, yeah, sure, uh, but it's an actual warming of global average temperatures. So we don't really use the word global warming or the phrase global warming anymore um, because I guess it was easier for deniers to say like, oh, it's not warming. See, there's snow. And that's a stupid <laughs> argument. Uh, but it is overall a warming in global temperatures. Uh, the average temp around the world is higher than it was uh, on, along the same graph as the, the change in carbon dioxide. Uh, so warming in of average temperatures, yeah. Uh, that's gonna cause a uh, glacial melt, melting glaciers. Now melting glaciers alone, you think, well, I've never seen a glacier. Maybe you have, most of you probably haven't. Why does that affect you? Um, melting glaciers, one, yes, causes a rise in sea level. Now, it's not going to be 200 to 300 feet. It's not going to be that number that I told you before, because the sea level is already higher than it was during the last ice age, because we don't have very many glaciers left on Earth. Um, but it might rise by 50 feet in the next like 100 years, uh, which maybe doesn't matter to you. Uh, but we're expecting, we're assuming five feet by 2050.
we talked about this a little bit the other day. What does five feet in 30 years do? Well, it depends where you live. Uh, if you live near the ocean, it probably has a big influence on you. If you live in Pasadena, uh, you probably won't be flooded. But if you get water from anywhere near the ocean, then that does have a big influence on you, and that's us. Our fresh water, our drinking water, all the water you get it from the tap, not all of it, 90% of it, comes from Northern California uh, that is in danger of this. So you should be afraid of that. Like that's, a, You should probably lay in bed to, like, at some point and have nightmares about <laughs> this. Like That's appropriate. Um, but uh, engineers who manage our water, the State Water Project, are planning for that. They're assuming that that's going to happen. Um, and as long as they build fast enough and nothing bad happens along the way, we should be okay. What if we have a big earthquake that breaks everything while they're trying to account for this? Bummer. So melting glaciers, rise in sea level. Um, when we were talking about uh, albedo and the reflection of, reflection of incoming solar radiation, uh, we talked about how having ice on Earth reflects solar energy back out to space. So it actually cools the Earth off to have ice. So when you lose glaciers, you're losing a cooling surface and replacing it usually with water, which absorbs more energy and it turns on into a heating surface. So lose solar reflection. And then, um, also very important, I don't want to say more important than sea level rise, but very importantly, uh, is a change in water resources, a shift in the availability of water. So, um, you don't really get your drinking water from glaciers. Cool, you're safe from that. Uh, but half of all humans, this is a weird thing to think about, 7.4 whatever billion people on Earth, half of them get their drinking water from the Himalayas here. That's an amazing thing. Uh, half of all humans get their fresh water from the Himalayas right here. And so uh, that's South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia. They get rain, yeah, but then the Himalayas get a whole bunch of snow during the winter. And during dry seasons, that snow melts and it trickles down through Asia, South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, um, in the form of rivers and gives all the people living in these areas uh, fresh drinking water. Half of all humans get their fresh water from those melting glaciers. When those glaciers are gone, half of all humans lose their permanent source of drinking water. That's a scary thing. Questions. Well, so the monsoon would be the rainy season, and so like during the rainy season, uh, South Asia gets a whole ton of water, and that's that's pretty good. But it's mostly like the the southern part of South Asia here, kind of below the Tropic of uh, Cancer. But uh, the the most populated parts of India are in the north up here. So they, they aren't really monsoon climates. Like they're, they're kind of, they're on the border. Um, but they don't have the, like the, the five feet of rain. South, South Asia down here gets like five feet of rain in the monsoon time. Um, north of that where most people are, don't have that. Uh, so the monsoon helps, but not exactly where you need it. Because like mon hardcore monsoon climates are also hard to live in. You can't have a city where it rains five feet in three months. Um, not really, no. The, the monsoon winds come from the Indian Ocean, from south, and, and kind of putter out. Uh, and when it's monsoon raining in South Asia, the Himalayas are usually drier. Yeah. Other questions? Good one. Um, okay, so glaciers melt, a whole bunch of bad things happen. Um, the uh, carbon dioxide in the ocean... 
uh, causes what's called marine dead zones. So ocean water has a specific balance of uh, oxygen, carbon, uh, different minerals. And when that uh, composition changes, then it kills plants and animals. It'd be exactly like if uh, the concentration of air or minerals in the food that you eat or the water that you drink changed drastically so that people couldn't live. It's just like that, but in the ocean. So you can kind of think of these as like big deserts underwater where there used to be life. There might have been a, a coral reef or a kelp forest or some other uh, highly productive uh, marine wildlife area. Uh, and extra carbon dioxide is causing uh, huge die-offs in that. And then, not really because of carbon dioxide, but uh, there's also a rise in ocean temperatures. Which, just like land creatures and plants, uh, stuff in the ocean doesn't like it when it gets too hot. Put it simply. Um, last major one, well, no, second to last one, uh, is desertification. Desertification. So a desert is a place, by definition, that receives 10 inches or less of rainfall per year. Okay, 10 inches or less of rainfall per year, cool. Desertification is a process where places that were not a desert turn into a desert. So um, it's the process of different environments, parts of the world, becoming more dry. Drying of climates so that, again, you receive less rainfall than you used to. In the 90s, this happened in a place called the, the Sahel in Africa. So on the, in, in Africa, the biggest desert in the world is the Sahara. The edge of the Sahara is called the Sahel, and it's this big, vast grassland that's like a huge area of land. Um, and people figured out there's a whole bunch of aquifer groundwater stuff in the Sahel. And uh, when it started digging wells and drilling and getting that water out of the ground. So then people moved into the Sahel, and you have this huge population increase, and people move in, and they start 